some safe travel as well. May we all receive a blessing this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 88 I seen the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command, and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed his creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed wherever I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky. There's not a plant or flower below but makes thy glory. And clouds arise and tempests blow, but <coughs> order from thy throne. Creatures that borrow life from thee are subject to thy care. There's not a place where we can flee, but God is present there. Thank you. Y'all sounded very well. I turn it over to the pastor. Okay, I will not say good morning, we'll say good evening. <laughs> well, glad you made it tonight. It is kind of uh, almost last night of the week, so looking forward to tomorrow, getting ready for Sabbath, you know, Friday. Hopefully we see more people for uh, the Vesper and our last evening session is tomorrow. Then we have Sabbath morning as well. So thank you for being blissfully coming and we are very blessed with these presentations. So let's pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we are very thankful that we are here. We ask you to continue to bless us, Lord, and help us to learn something new as well. In Jesus' name, Amen. Everyone. No, it's okay. I, I felt like that thing was going to collapse yesterday. So. I was like, please have mercy on me, Lord. Don't let that thing collapse over. How are you all tonight? Um, it's many lessons on health in the sanctuary, but I don't want to be sounding like I'm overreaching, so that concerns me. So I want to be really careful. <laughs> Find, putting something there that's not there but these are just applications and trying to teach us about health as well but <clears throat> I wanted to do a demonstration but I'll wait till later if we have time but tonight I wanted to talk about nutrition let's see here um, we've talked about sunlight and air to, so tonight is nutrition I, I um, I've, we'll, we've done water already, so I'm a little bit out of order, but we'll talk about nutrition tonight <clears throat> and what it means. A few things I would like to read from the paper that you're getting, and then we'll go. I always like to add a reading, and because <clears throat> I'm a teacher, and that's what you're supposed to do, give people paper and read, okay? okay. But I, I want to read the first three paragraphs. <clears throat> but people in the audience could help me be nice. 
So the first paragraph, these um, reading is from the Ministry of Healing, page 296 to 299. But I think the first three, actually the first four, are really important. <clears throat> Somebody like to read the first one, or should we not do that because it's recorded, Pastor? I should just read it myself? Okay. Our, the first paragraph, our bodies are built up for from the food we eat. Do you realize that? Is that paradigm change? That was a paradigm change for me. I just thought food is just a, you look at it, mm, you eat it, it looks good. Seafood. Mm -hmm, seafood, yeah. And it's supposed that it's food that you taste to give you pleasure and fill your belly, you know. But you don't really realize that your body is built by that food that you put in your body. There is a constant breaking down of the tissues of the body. Every movement of every organ involves waste. And this waste is repaired from our food. Isn't that a magnificent statement? Each organ of the body requires its share of nutrition. The brain must be supplied with its portion. The bones, the muscles, the nerves demands theirs. It is a wonderful process that transforms the food into blood and uses the blood to build up the varied parts of the body. But the process is going on continually supplying with life and strength and nerve, muscle, and tissue. So that's how important your food is. It helps, re it repairs what has been damaged because of the weight, getting rid of the waste. And it supplies energy to every organ of the body. Second paragraph, those foods should be chosen that best supply the elements needed for building up the body. In this choice, appetite is not a safeguard. So when you're choosing the right foods for your body, you can't trust your appetite because your appetite is going to do what? It tells you. Through wrong habits of eating, the appetite has been perverted. Often it demands food that impairs health and causes weakness instead of strength. So if you depend on your appetite, it's going to choose the wrong thing for your body. We cannot safely be guarded by the customs of society. The disease and suffering that everywhere prevails are largely due to the popular errors in regard to diet. In order to know what are the best foods, we must study what? God's original plan for man's diet. He who created man and who understands his needs appointed Adam his food. Behold, he said, I have given you every herb yielding seed, every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food. This is in Genesis 1.29. Upon leaving Eden to gain his livelihood by tilling the earth under the curse of sin, man received permission to eat also the herb of the field. So first we were eating just fruit, you know, fruits from the trees and things from the trees. And then after sin, we were allowed to eat the herbs, the vegetables of the field. And then the last one I want to teach you is grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our creator. That's actually a little song. These foods prepare in, prepared how? In a simple do you prepare your food simple? Or do you have to put a whole lot of stuff on there so you can get it down? <laughs> like you're taking medicine. <laughs> so it should be prepared as simple and natural as possible are the most helpful and nourishing. They impart a strength, a power of endurance, and a vigor of intellect that are not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet. So what kind of diet will give us the best health? A simple diet. So today I'm just going to go through a few slides as time will allow. And I just want to push this point on nutrition. I want to tell you what not having good nutrition leads to. These are old statistics. This is an old slides presentation I have. I'm going to tell you it's not any better. <laughs> so let's look at it. 12.6 million people have coronary heart disease. Okay, that's just in America. But heart disease is a universal problem. Okay, I think last year, I'm looking, thinking I have another presentation I do for the health guests. And I think, last, no, in 2020, 
516,000 people died. Uh, 516,000 people died of just heart disease. That's a lot of people, isn't that? Okay, that's a lot of people. 1.1 million people suffer from heart attacks in a given year. Does that sound like a pandemic status? Yes, and that's just in America. 17 million people have diabetes. Diabetes on the list of causes of death from the CDC is number seven, but that's not including diabetes as a cause of, can be cause of stroke and coronary disease, um, um, renal failure, uh, blindness. The highest number of people of amputations is because of diabetes. And so it should be higher, but it's about number seven because the diseases are separated. 90 to 95% of the causes of type two diabetes, which is, associ is associated with what? Obesity and physical inactivity. So that means if we could remove the obesity and get people to move and we could reduce diabetes. We see it all the time in the lifestyle center with a new diet, exercising, a few little herbs, you know, and we can see in seven to 10 days, a reversal of people who've had diabetes 12 years plus, okay? 16 million people have pre-diabetes and most of them don't know it. Let me tell you some figures. Most people found out they have diabetes when they have lost a lot of beta cell uh, ability to produce beta cells, which produces insulin. When usually when you find out you are diabetic, you've already lost cell, cell damage to your kidneys already, okay, when you're diagnosed, because most pre-diabetics don't know, okay, and so we want to help them with this. 107,000 people are newly diagnosed with colon cancer each year. What do you think the number one reason for colon cancer? It could be genetics, environment, but the number one is 70% is the consumption of meat, okay, away from the original diet, is that right? 300,000 people suffer from hip fractures each year. 50 million people have high blood pressure. Nearly 50 million adults ages 20 to 74 or 27% of the population are obese, okay, overweight. More than 108 million adults, that's about 61% of adult population are obese and overweight. So, though, you know, that's a lot of fat people walking around, okay. Why, why, how do you know if you're about to have some kind of disease? Here is a, a way we can check it out. Let's look at this. This is from insurance companies. They can tell you whether or not they should give you insurance and how much they should charge you for the insurance because they can tell how close you are to death by these. This is what they go by. This is from the insurance company, okay? If you're weight, if you're five feet, that's 100 pounds. For every inch, excuse me, for every five pounds, excuse me, for every other inch, you add five pounds, okay? So if you're five feet three, then you're 115 for a female. That would be for a small frame, okay? They have small, medium, and large frame. Also, culturally, it may be different, but this is a baseline, okay? Now, when you take a cancer di uh, analysis, this is what they'll ask you. What is your current weight, and what was your high school weight? And um, if they're not close together, then they'll, they'll tell you. So they don't go by this anymore. They go by your weight, current weight and your high school. When you're a freshman in high school, what was your weight? Your hip to waist ratio. For women, it should be 0.8. For men, no more than 1.0. Okay. And that's when I, if I measure the two and div divide it, that sh it should end up with 0.8 for women, 1.0 for men. So your cholesterol levels, your, you should have a lab test at least once a year to know your, your cholesterol levels, your HDLs, your LDLs, your total cholesterol, at least once a year. I do that as my birthday present, okay? My birthday present is to pay for the lab work to see where I am, okay? I do it once a year. If I'm doing really good, I'll do it every other year, but if I'm like, Dr. Emerson says, Angela, you need to work on your insulin level. Okay. It's not out of normal, but it's high normal. I want it down here. He asked me, do you want to be normal with a regular American on the standard diet? No, 
then you need to come down to the middle. Don't be high normal, okay? So you need to work on that. Your CRP, this will tell you your inflammation, heart inflammation status. It should be less than three. Is that right, Jody? Yeah, less than three. Your A1 hemoglobin A1C should be below seven. Okay, I like to see it around four, no more than 4.7. That's what I like, okay? Because you remember the standard, the basis of the numbers for the lab is based on the average American, who's the standard American diet. So you want to, you don't want to be, oh, well, I'm 6.8. Well, you're 6.8 compared to those that ate uh, McDonald's. You want to be in the middle or the low normal. Does that make sense? Okay. Your creatinine, this is, tells you how do your, your kidneys deal with the protein in your body. And you, it wants to be below 1.2. And you should get a liver profile, especially if those who eat refined foods. You want to see what, what, how your liver is functioning and how it's dealing with the, the fatty refined diet that we might have. Okay. And so these are some of the things that you want to ask to evaluate your health and how close you are are to disease or away from disease. And all of these things right here can be changed. Is that right? Okay. By nutrition, exercise, sunlight, air, rest, and all of those divine trust in God. Okay. I'll take questions in the end, Joe. Give me just a minute. Okay. I love this definition um, from Councils on Health, page 90, paragraph one, that disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from the violation of the laws of health. Now, I don't like when this, this is misused, and it often is, especially among people who know about health, like, like the Seventh-day Adventists. Someone's sick and they start seeing which one you breaking. Oh yeah, I never saw Angela exercising and I saw her eat some this and that. Yeah, yeah, that's why she got that. Um, she breaks, I saw her break all those laws. That's not the point, okay? All right? But the point is the closer we are to the way God originally made us and we eat and do the things are close to he made us, then the closer we'll be to good health. The farther we get off the road, I call it, the worse it will be. Okay, so we want to stay where? In the road. Why is there an increase of disease? Because people are getting off of the road. Okay, let's look at this road. It's a two, two strips in the middle. What does that mean? No, no passing. So if I pass in a no passing, am I increasing my chances of getting an accident or decreasing my chances? Increasing, right? What about the white lines? If I go off on the white lines because I'm looking at the beautiful trees, and I'll say, look how nice it is. And I'm not looking where I'm going and I'm the driver. Okay. And I go off the white lines. What is that telling me? I'm breaking the law. It's danger. The more I go off the white line, am I in, am I most safe being off the road? No. The more I go off the white line, the more I go toward the trees, the increase of accident and the, will it be a good to my health or a bad for my health? bad. So when we go off the road of health, the white lines is God's law. Okay. Immutable law that cannot be changed. And he's given us laws of health. There are more than the eight actually. Okay. Right. But he's given us these laws, these white lines. He wants us to stay in the middle and he doesn't want us to cross the line when there's a no passing. He wants us to stay in our lane. But when we go off, then that's what happens. All right. So we want to stay. The typical American diet is off the road. Let's just say it like it is. It is off the road. And so when people eat this diet and then they get a horrible diagnosis, they really don't know. You have been off the road for 50 years. You should be happy. You are, you are better than you should be, right? So if we've been off the road for years and years and years, what can we expect? Disease is coming, right? So let's look at it. Nutrition, high fat diet, animal fat, high and unhealthy fat, saturated and hydrogenated. I can't talk. H hydrogenated. Yes, that's the word. I knew. I knew. I knew that word. Um, low in fiber, high in processed foods, low in complex carbohydrates, and low in plant-based foods. This will give you off the road. What else? A high-fat diet. At the present time in America, we average. More than 45% of our dietary calories is in the form of fat, okay? What happens if we eat a lot of fat? We create something called insulin resistance, 
Okay. So what happens is all of your cells have receptors, and I like to say they're like door hinges that go, and they open and let things into the cell, and they close. But let's say they're stuck and they can't open. They can't open. So I eat that donut, okay, from Dunkin' Donuts, and I get a soy latte, okay? A lot of sugar, right? And my body processes it, and the, here comes the pancreas producing keys and saying, open the cell so we can get that sugar from that donut and that latte. But if my cell is stuck and I can't get it open, it stays in my blood, okay? Does that make sense? And so my body says, oh, the door is broke, but make more keys, see if we can open it. Okay? And we just wear out our little pancreas because it's trying to send beta cells to make more and more keys. Okay? And so we get insulin resistance, and there we go. We're going to have more fat. Our skin, our skin has to start taking up the sugar. And it's just a horrible thing. Okay? And so this is what happened. And the main cause is fat. Okay, the fatty American diet. In one recent survey, it was 50% of the people ate fat. That's a lot of fat. 50% of your diet, fat. That's a lot of fat, right? So people say, what kind of fat can I eat? You mean I can't have any oil? If you're diabetic, no oil. No. Obese, no oil. That's right. You heard me. No oil. Okay. <laughs> The oil in the sanctuary was to burn the candles, right? Right? And it's a sign of the Holy Spirit. That you can have a lot of, okay? Ask God for that. But we want to have a low, no-fat diet if we have diabetes, if we're dealing with obesity. We want to have it low. For those that are not, I think a good option is to have it as low as possible. And you can do it. It can taste really delicious, okay? A study found that women who ate the most total fat increased their risk of what? Breast cancer by 60% compared to those who are eating what? A lower amount. We know this in other countries. The China study done by Dr. Colin Campbell, when he went all over China, he saw the people who are living out, eating their little, from their little gardens, very little meat, very little fat, he saw that they have very little disease. And as he came closer to the big cities where the people are trying to be like the West, he saw their diseases match the West. Okay? And so we know that this low-fat, healthy diet, plant, whole plant, is really a blessing. Here's one. Researchers at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston found that heart attacks are four times more likely to occur two hours after eating a large fatty meal. Okay. We saw this. We had a health guest. She was really, she had a cancer diagnosis and she was really improving. But she said, I can't stand this diet. And one day she went to a buffet and she ate everything she wanted to eat. And she died of a heart attack. She didn't even die of her cancer. Two hours later after that. You see? And so it is true. This research is true. So we want to be really careful. Protein. Can you get protein from your fruits and vegetables? Some people say, no, you got to have a, a sirloin. But let's see if that true. Two to three times more protein is consumed than required. Do you know what's required? We're going to talk about that. Animal protein increases the risk of osteoporosis because over protein robs the body of calcium. Okay. And so let's see it. How much are required? In children, one to three years old, 16 grams. Adults, let's go to the adults, 45 to 65 grams. And um, females, 60, I mean, 46 to 50 grams. How much do the Americans eat? About 100 grams per day of protein. Even the vegan is over 60 to 80 protein. But plant-based protein is not like animal-based protein. The, the plant-based protein does not require calcium to dissimulate like the animal base. Okay. And so what, what about fiber? We need fiber, but these things lack fiber. Anything that's been processed does not have fiber and it doesn't have nutrition. So refined foods lack fiber. The majority of them do not have the minerals and vitamins that we need. They're rich in fat, sugar, salt, and calories. 
there's a doctor. He always says, when you go to the restaurant, all you're getting is fat, sugar, and salt. So you, when you go to the restaurant, you're choosing whether I'm getting Chinese fat, sugar, and salt. Or if I go to the, if I go to the uh, Southern cooking, I'm getting Southern fat, sugar, and salt. Or if I go to the Italian restaurant, Italian fat, sugar, and salt. It's the same, okay? Just in different flavors, okay? So we want to be really careful. And we want to remember that refined foods make up over 60% of the typical diet today. So are people on the road of health or off the road? Very much off the road. And what we need to do is encourage them. I want to end with these other things that are hidden. Refined foods, couscous is a good food, but couscous is refined. Okay? Unless you get the whole grain one. Okay. Pretzels are refined, even though they look brown on the outside. White grits is refined, so you want to use a yellow grit, more, more pure. Corn flakes is refined. Okay. Sometimes we don't think about that. And so I can go on and on, but I do want to end with this one about sugar. Sugar will compromise your immune system. Just show you this. This is from Agatha Thrash. She is the founder of Uchi Pines, and I love her data. She did a lot of research when she was living, and so I borrowed this from her. One, a zero teaspoons of sugar. When you don't eat sugar, when bacteria comes, right away, your fighter cells, killer cells, can eat up about 14 bacteria. If you eat a teaspoon of sugar, or six teaspoons of sugar, now you can only fight 10. 12 teaspoons of sugar, 5.5 of those same bacteria. 18 teaspoons of sugar, you can fight two. And 24, one. And over that, nothing. Your whole body just sleep. Okay? All right? And so when the bacteria comes, guess what? You will become sick. So when the, Joe and I really did good when the COVID came. We didn't eat any sugar. Okay? We didn't. We need to get back to that, Joe. <laughs> All right, and so this is it. So instead of um, destroying all of these things, we leave these bacteria because our body cannot fight. And so I want to end, this will keep going on and on. I have a long presentation and time won't allow, but I want to end. I can't see that the vegetarian diet, the whole plant-based diet is the superior diet. Why? Because it's the optimal diet. It is the diet from heaven. Everything that you buy that you've ever bought in your life, did it come with a manual, some kind of directions? When you bought a car, did it come with the manual in the glove box in the old days? Now it's on a CD or sometimes you have a link to know. But everything that you've ever bought had some directions. Isn't that true? Okay. Well, the creator of that knew what was best for it. What about our creator? Does he know what is best? And his original diet was the vegetarian, the superior diet where nutrition can help us be the sanctuary for God. A pure vegetarian diet reduces the risk of diseases. And I want to, if you have a vegetarian diet, you're 15% less chronic disease, decreases your utilization of health care facilities, dramatic decrease in medications, and superior muscular endurance, and greater longevity. And I want to end with um, uh, my own personal testimony is when I became a vegetarian. It was one of the best things I ever did. Okay? I, when I was 34, I was feeling so tired all the time. Well, I was working three jobs and I never cooked. I just go from one fast food to the other and I didn't have time for exercise or going. I was driving from one job to the other. My, my beverage of choice was soda, but it was caffeine free because I'm a good Adventist. Um, <laughs> you see my point? And so at 34, I go to my doctor, and he does blood work. And he tells me a story. He says, Angela, I want to tell you a story. And he said, there was this lady, and she is my weight, and I'm 6'2". And I, I started frowning. What you saying? He says, and her cholesterol levels, wow. And her insulin levels, boy, oh boy. If this woman doesn't change by 40, I'm going to be writing her prescriptions for hypertension and diabetes. And I said, Dr. Smithson, you're talking about me. And he said, if I'm talking about you, it's time to change. 
And I went, ooh, isn't that something? And by God's grace, I did change. And I'm 60 years old, my birthday, I turned 60. And I don't take any medications. Okay, I do have stress hypertension sometimes I have to work on, Jody knows that, okay? But I don't have diabetes and I have situational hypertension. I've got to learn how to deal with my stress. But I'm so happy, I'm 60 years old, I don't have any medication and I can still move my leg around. And I know it's a lot to do with Dr. Smithson telling me at 34, it's time to change. And so I wanna encourage you that God wants us to be of the best health. Let's end with second, it's uh, third John verse two. Mm -hmm. Can you turn there in your Bibles? Third John verse two. Yes. Yes, you want to lower your protein. Don't eat hot, high proteins and a lot of it. You know, us vegans, we eat a lot of nuts. Okay, and nuts are good, but when you go nuts on nuts, you're going to have a problem. Okay, so you want to reduce that. Um, tofu is a refined food. So any refined foods that we have in our diet, they should be used sparingly. They should not be our major food. Grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables in the most simplest form. Tofu is a complex form. We think it's not, but it is. Good question. Should we go to Burger King and get a, uh, impossible, burger? impossible Burger? That would be impossible if you want to keep good health. That's my answer. But in 3 John chapter 2, <laughs> Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. You know, before I didn't know, and I worked at a major hospital in North Carolina, and I told my friend, I'm going to bring you the, she was like, I want to get off meat. I said, I'm going to bring you a pack of grillers, okay? So I go and I bring her a pack of grillers, and I said, you need to try these. And then the next day she said, Angela, have you read the sodium content and the this and this and this? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. She said, I might as well eat my hamburger. Why you bring me this box? I was like, oh, I thought I was helping you out. Well, at least it doesn't have cholesterol. The, my, my deal is, is you need to read the labels, you know? And I say this to my health guests, if you can't pronounce it, either look it up or don't eat it, okay? And if it has a lot of ingredients, you wanna leave that alone, okay? And so those are my things I wanna say tonight. and and. The health message is not always the most popular, but we have to say what is true because God wants us to be temples for his Holy Spirit. May you be blessed. I never got to do my demonstration. Another day. <laughs> so if you want to live longer, watch out your diet, right? But if you want to go quickly, just go enjoy your time. <laughs> okay. Well, we are very grateful again for another presentation. Now we switch to the spiritual sanctuary as well. So again, let's have a quick word of prayer. Lord, we are very thankful for that message. And Lord, give us wisdom. Give us the ability that we make decision to change, Lord, for our better just pray for Dr. Carl as he's speaking to us about the sanctuary as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Yeah, if we could switch. Um, all right, it looks like somebody's already on it. There it is right there. I can see it. I see he'll double click it. Well, tonight we'll be dealing about uh, dealing with the sanctuary in Jesus. Perhaps no big, huge surprise, but hopefully we can uh, see some things that we haven't seen before and we can discover the, the different ways in which the sanctuary points to Jesus and just how valuable we are really in, the, in this plan of salvation. 
So, um, all right, these guys are these guys are on it, and uh, as soon as they hit as soon as they hit play, then we will. Yeah. There we. Okay. Oop. Okay, that's slide number nine. Okay, we can we can we can dial it back. There we go. All right. Okay. All right. Looks like you're seeing that. Okay. Very good. So the sanctuary in Jesus tonight. Well, as we walk as we walk through, of course, we know that uh, the altar of burnt offering is where the lambs uh, and the rams were sacrificed, and John the Baptist. Uh, see, I wasn't raised reading the Bible, and the first time I read John 1 29, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, you're like, why in the world is he calling Jesus a lamb? I mean, you just have no idea. But uh, that's very one, one very simple way in which the sanctuary provides background, much needed background information in order to tell us something about Jesus. And it also tells us something about the manner in which he died as well. Uh, because when you take uh, one of those one of those lambs, and it doesn't offer you any resistance at all, uh, as as you're putting it to death, another animal wouldn't work, but that animal captured kind of something about the life of Christ that was used there, and many more things could be said. Uh, as we move to uh, the the inside, you can see there the uh, on the north side the table of showbread. And in the sermon that Jesus preached in John chapter 6 at Capernaum, uh, he said, I am the bread of life in John chapter 6 and verse 35. And so just like physical bread, as we were learning tonight, that the uh, nutritional value of the food that we eat basically is the building blocks for converting that into blood, which nourishes the rest of the system, then Jesus as the word of God also, the principle works the same. And as we assimilate the word of God into our hearts and minds and souls, then it, then it builds mental and spiritual strength in, it, in each and every one of us. Well, you have the uh, seven branch candlestick uh, on the south side. And in John chapter 8 and verse 12, right after the incident of the woman that was caught in adultery, Jesus said, I am the light of this world. And as you look at the altar of incense, it reminds you of the work of mediation that the high priest and the priests would do. And it reminds me of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, which basically says there's only one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And uh, some of the blood um, from, the, from the sacrifice would be there and would mingle with the incense and that would go over the, over the veil there into the presence of God in the most holy place. So... Now, there's something uh, interesting as you look at the outside of the sanctuary. It looks pretty plain, doesn't it? It doesn't, it's not wowing you and saying, wow, what an awesome structure. Because it's just badger skin and goat skin and other things that are, that are covering that. And that teaches a very important principle and lesson about the person of Jesus as well. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 and 2, it says, when we see him, there's no outward beauty that we would desire him. So he wouldn't make it to GQ magazine. He, you know, he's not going to stun you and wow you by all of the, all of the outward manifestations. That would have been Judas. Um, okay. That, he, he would have been, it's like, and that's why they're like, oh, hey, this guy's got to be the guy. Look at him. You know, but the Bible says concerning Jesus, it, it, he, he wasn't wowing us, you know, with the, with the outward here. And, and the sanctuary kind of teaches that lesson. You're looking at it from the outside and you're like, well, that's, that's just covered by goat skin, but. But then when you, when you look at the inside, uh, that's where the real beauty lies. It's, it's um, you know, the seven, everything was overlaid with gold. So the preciousness of it was on the inside. And so Jesus came in the likeness of men and he died in our place. His divinity was clothed with humanity. And so it kind of, uh, it kind of can illustrate that in a very, in a very powerful way. Well, as we continue to move, uh, as we continue to move on, then you're in the then you're in the most holy place where you have the visible uh, uh, manifestation of God's presence in the Shekinah glory there above the mercy seat and between the cherubims. 
So I want to talk a little bit about that this evening. So I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to, to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Now, Moses has been tending sheep for quite a while. He was educated in the uh, school of the pharaohs, and he did very well there. He was uh, a military man. He was, he was being groomed to be a statesman. Uh, he was a man of valor. Uh, lots of things going for him. But the Lord saw fit that he needed a different kind of education. Now, as he's getting to the end of that education, it says in uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked. And behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now that's not something that you see every day. This is, this is an occurrence that is violating the simple laws of nature. I mean, many of us see things burning, and when they burn, they get consumed. And Moses is seeing this bush burning, but it's not consumed. And he's like, hey, wait, that, that is it. I, I need to go check this out. You know, and I wonder how many ways the Lord is trying to get our attention. He, he gets our attention by doing things that don't make sense. A person should have died in that car accident. There's no way they should have lived, but yet they're living. It, it, it violates like all the laws of nature. Something that goes outside, these are, the, these are the things that he uses in order to try to get our attention. And if we're listening, then we'll be led to inquire, hey, why did this happen? Why am I here? And look at what Moses is doing. So he sees this bush that is burning but is not consumed. And Moses says, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. He says, I want to check this out. Now, I want you to notice at this point in the story that Moses just doesn't simply fall down and start worshiping the bush because he doesn't know what's there. He has no idea. He sees it burning, but he, he doesn't know that God is there. Now, when you get to verse 4, it says, When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, this teaches a very important lesson. Uh, and that is, this physical manifestation was not enough to convince Moses that God was there. It was only when God spoke to him that he realized, aha, God is in the midst of the bush, all right? It is the word of God that is most important here. And so he introduces himself as the God of his fathers in the past. As they continue on this discussion and God is calling Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, Moses says, but wait a minute, when I get down there and I begin to introduce you and they ask, you know, what is his name? What am I supposed to say? And we pick this up in verse 14 and 15 of Exodus 3. And this is kind of where we're going to single in on the Shekinah glory and its relationship to Jesus later on as we develop this. So in verse 14, God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now I want you to notice in the very next verse, it says, God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. Then he says, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So in verse 14, it says, I am hath sent me unto you. In verse 15, it says, the Lord God hath sent me unto you. Furthermore, this is my name and my memorial unto all generations. So I am means the self-existent one. Um, I am is not synonymous with I became. So when you think of the words I am, I've got these four other uh, principles or concepts that kind of flow out of it. Um, so I am is associated with eternity because it's not I became. Um, 
So I became is not compatible with I am. And so we're talking about eternal time in the past. I am, again, is not I became, so he's not changing. In other words, he is unchangeable. So the I am is associated with certain aspects of God's character and God's reality that are unchangeable. I am, of course, implies an existence, that he exists. And it implies a presence, a presence in all places and all times as well. All right, so all those things are synonymous with the I am. And again, the I am is not compatible with I became. So we're going to look at the I am and the uh, connection then to Jesus. Now, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but it was translated into Greek by 70 scholars. All right. And so... Uh, the I am is attributable to God the Father in Revelation 1 verse 4 and 4 verse 8. It talks about he who is and who was and who is to come. That word is, now I know those are two Greek letters up there, or two, you know, two, two Greek words. Um, and, and so, uh, and, and those, are, those are the two Greek words that are in the Greek translation of Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 concerning the I am. And so when John, who was writing in Greek, he had to make a grammatical error, and I'm not getting going to get into all the grammatical issues there in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. But he purposefully violated the laws of Greek grammar to make a point that he was introducing the I am, in other words, when he said the one who is, um, and then who was and who is to come. So that was connected with the Father. But it's also connected, of course, with the Son. In John chapter 8, verse 24, there's a massive discussion that is taking place between Jesus and the religious leaders. And he says something very interesting. He says, therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am. Now, the next word in most Bibles is written in italics, which means that it was supplied by the translators. All right. Now. Those that can speak more than one language know that you often have to supply words in order to make the translation uh, much more bearable in that language. And there are some times when words are supplied when it clarifies, and there are some times when words are supplied when it detracts from the meaning of the original text. And this is one of those times. And so Jesus is saying, uh, you're going to die in your sins if you do not believe that I am. So this whole idea of the divinity of Jesus is incredibly important because he's saying if we do not believe that he is the I am, then ultimately he's saying we will die in our sins. Notice also four verses later. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, what's that a reference to? Yeah, his death on the cross, right? Yeah, Jesus, correct. John 12 verse 31. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am. Again, he is supplied. So who is the one that died on the cross for you and for me? Yeah, and, and he is the great I am as well. Yes. So I, and I want to make that point because when I first became a Christian, when I first started studying the Bible, I thought, well, when Jesus was born, that's when he showed up. <laughs> you know, when you don't have all this, you know, all this training and before it's like, well, OK, well, where did he come? OK, well, that, that, that's that's when he arrived. Well, no, that's that's no, that's not the complete story. All right. And so this was not just a mere man that hung on the cross. This is the great I am. Now, that should teach us a little something about how we are valued and the price that was paid for us. You know why young people do a bunch of crazy things? Because they don't know their value. And they do all kinds of things in order to, to impress people and, and, all this types of, and all these types of things because they don't know who they are in Christ. They don't discern their value. And Jesus says, You're, you'll know at that point that I'm the I am. Moving on. In John chapter 8, verse 58, the one we mostly know, as he's concluding his argument with the religious leaders, he says, Most assuredly, I say unto you, before I, Abraham was, I am. Now, in the original language, the word was is the word for came into being or existed. <laughs> before Abraham existed, 
uh, I am. <laughs> so it's kind of like this play on words in the original language. And he couldn't have stated it more clearly because what did the Jews do at that point? They took up stones in order to stone him. Why? Because he was claiming titles and prerogatives that belonged to God alone. And there they are looking at him and they're thinking he's just a mere man. There's another text in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8. And in, in chapter 5 verse 7 it talks about Jesus offering up you know, these prayers with crying and tears, you know, in his humanity. And in chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Though being a son, though he were a son in the King James. And in most of the translations, son is capitalized. And I'm like, why, why, does, why do they capitalize it? And this is, this is an instance where if you go to the original languages, it helps. And so that first, that first word after son, uh, you've heard of alpha and omega? Well, that's the first letter there, omega. And then the other letter looks like a V, but it's kind of an N sound. All right. And so that, that little participle is taking you back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. It's saying that he is the divine son and he has always existed and his father has always existed. And as long as both of them have existed, this structure of father and son has always existed between the two. Uh, he never became a son. He always was a son. All the way back to eternity past. So it's a contradiction to assert then that the son had a beginning or that he ever became a son. And so there was re never really a time when the father was alone. And if Jesus had a beginning, then John 8, 58 should read, Before Abraham was, I became, not I am. If he had a beginning. Uh, John 14, verse 6 should read, I became the way, the truth, and the life, not I am the way, the truth, and the life. It would be unethical for Jesus to claim to exist eternally when in fact he knew that he was brought into existence at some point in the past. That would be a lie. And so, and he would cease to be the way, the truth, and the life. Now, the word became is only applied to his incarnation. For instance, in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, it says concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now in the, uh, I think this is the new King James, uh, and it may be the King James as well. It says, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now you need a, you need a refund on that translation because it's not the word for born. It's the word for he, he entered into, he became, he arrived, in other words. It's not the word that is used to give birth. There's a, uh, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Again, uh, a better translation is made of a woman, and this is the King James, made under the law. So the new King James is born, I believe, and then the King James is actually made. So he was made of a woman. It actually uses the word to become. In other words, all right? So it's drawing a contrast between the I am, the unchangeable I am, and the one who became as well. Uh, and it's also applied to his high priestly ministry um, also. And I'm going to get to another very important one in just a moment. So in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, I am is God's name. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, he says, Let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 5, also in verse 11, he told the children of Israel to, um, uh, as, 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 he, as he was making plans to meet with them, he says he was going to choose the place for them to meet with him. And so the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And this was the sanctuary. All right. So in Exodus 25 verse 8, he says, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And then he says in Deuteronomy, I want you to go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. Those are two different ways of saying that God would make himself present in the place where he chooses. That's what he's basically saying, that he would be present there in that, in that sanctuary. Let's move on. The, uh, the most important passage is the one here in John chapter 1, verse 14. It says, and the word became flesh. 
So you have the eternal word, the eternal I am, it says, then became flesh and then dwelt among us. That word dwelt is from the Greek word skini, and I'll show you the significance of that. Because that word is found in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 2, where it says, Jesus is the minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. That word tabernacle is skini. All right. So uh, the Greek word skini is derived from the word shakan, which means shekinah or God's presence. Okay. So what is this basically saying? The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, he pitched his tent among us. All right. So the literal Shekinah in the Old Testament, during the Old Testament period, the visible light, that manifestation of God's glory was Christ. And it was he who, uh, he who came and had flesh put on him. All right. So he's saying he's literally the Shekinah in flesh. And this provides a continuity then between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Have you ever talked to people and say, well, no, no, the Old Testament God is different from the New Testament God. Well, the sanctuary doesn't allow for that because the sanctuary is saying, no, no, no. The visible manifestation of God's presence in the Old Testament is Jesus Christ in the flesh, you know, in the New Testament. That's the same God. All right. So, um, so I guess very simply the appeal here this, this evening is uh, as the I am, Jesus became human. And, you know, he will retain his human nature forever. When you read um, uh, Revelation chapter 22, it describes him as, well, let me just read it. And um, I hope I have that right. Yes. In verse 1, it says, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So this is after the millennium, right? This is after the millennium. This is in the new heavens and in the new earth. And what does it refer to him as? It refers to him as lamb. That means his human nature is still there. It didn't go away. Now, you may be surprised, but uh, in the theological books of, 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 of our other Christian friends, when Jesus is through down here, he goes back to whatever form he had before he became human. Okay, But that isn't the case in the Bible. And um, again, I mean... Just think about the, the, the magnitude of that. You know, we talk about the distance between heaven and earth being like so vast, but the distance between I am and I became is even vaster. Okay. Yeah. That's like, okay, well, you got to, you want to save the, the lions? Okay, now you're going to become incarnated into one of them. Not just, you know, that, 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 we, we can't grasp that. <laughs> Only on the other side will we begin to even realize the depth of the sacrifice that he has made. And so this should have, you know, people suffer from all kinds of uh, um, low self-esteem. We've had all kinds of stuff happen to us. Maybe we didn't have the best upbringing. Maybe our parents didn't speak to us the best way. Maybe we suffered abuse and we think, you know, I'm good for nothing. You know, what, what am I good for? Well, uh, you know... Look at what Jesus had done. He, he doesn't do that for worthless human beings. He is the merchant man. He is the one that was seeking goodly pearls. He was the one that had everything and then looked. And when he saw you, he found the pearl of great price. And he was willing to forsake all of that in order to purchase you and to purchase me. He, is, he was looking for you. So you are of infinite value to him. And so if the I am became... So that you and I could also be part of the, the firstborn ones who are worshiping him in spirit and in truth, who truly worship him, then what are we willing to do and to be for him? So let's ponder and think about that question as we think about what Jesus has done for us. So I want to turn it over to the pastor at this time. Thank you, and we thank our online audience who are listening and watching, and I believe it has been a rich evening. So, grateful we have one more night, is tomorrow evening for Sabbath as well, and Sabbath morning. So, switch to the prayer request here. Hope you